The challenge of teaching in a room like this is seeing everybody because you're so spread out. So that means, please raise your hand, make yourself visible so I can see you. Ecclesiastes is a look at the human life. And we all living the, are living the human life. We have firsthand experience. So we should all be able to make some comments and uh, participate. So please make yourself visible. I'd like to hear from you. Ecclesiastes is not a book we look at typically or in great depth. And in some ways, it's very straightforward. And in other ways, it's just a big tangled pile of spaghetti. But if you like the Cliff's Notes version, the author helps you out because he tells you the bottom line up front and the bottom line at the very end. So if you like to read the ending of the book first, he tells it right out. Ecclesiastes 1, 2 and 12, 8, it's the same words. Vanity of vanity, says a preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. He sums it up right there for you. So, Ecclesiastes is not something we look at because it's really convoluted. In a lot of ways, Ecclesiastes is an old man just telling a meandering story, and he's got tangents all over the place, and he throws in parenthetical statements. And we've all listened to some old man pontificate. This is what I did in my younger days. And he gets lost, he loses his train of thought, he comes back, and he just tells this meandering story. And that's what the author does. But while it's this meandering pile of spaghetti over here, on the other hand, if you look at it, it is a scientific article. He starts out, if you look at what's in a scientific article, you've got an abstract. These are my backgrounds, this is my objectives. These are the methods and materials of my experiment that I'm going to conduct. This is the result of my experiment, and this is my conclusion. So while on one hand you've got this meandering old man telling this rambling story, on the other hand, you've got this eloquent scientific discourse. So how do we make sense of all of that? I've got too many remotes. All right. Now, Ecclesiastes is not a big book or a long book. Twelve chapters, 222 verses, and we've got 12 weeks. Are we going to do a chapter a week? Absolutely not. This is not like Isaiah in 12 or 13 weeks, where you're looking at the forest, but you can't see the trees. It's not a quarter study of 1 John, where you see the trees, but you don't see the forest. So we want to see the forest. We want to see the trees. But... Ecclesiastes has a very unique point of view. So while we look at the forest, we look at the trees, we have to put it in context. Where do the trees and where do the forest fit with everything else? So we're going to talk more about Ecclesiastes and Ecclesiastes in particular tonight. And we're going to start with a test. And I've got a test for everybody, and I want everybody to participate. And you're going to say the answers to yourself. All right, question one, who's the current president? Who's the president before that president? And one before that? Go back in your mind, see how many presidents you can name off. And when you're finished, just raise your hand so I know you're done. I'm starting to see some hands. So, there's the list. Now think about which was the last president remembered in relation to the year you were born. It's pretty close, isn't it? Why is that? Because our concept of history begins with our personal history. So when we look at history, and we look back at the time that this book was written, we look at it from the, from the objective of our personal history. We put those values there. How about our culture? When we look at other things, we look at it through the eyes of our culture. Corey's getting ready to go to India, which is a place he's very familiar with. But 
Or he grew up in the United States, which has a Judeo-Christian heritage. All of a sudden, he's going to spend a protracted amount of time in a nation that has a Hindu-Muslim heritage, which has a vastly different culture. So, our culture is different from the culture in other countries, but in other times. We have to be cognizant of that. What about our values? How are our values shaped? When we look at others, we look at those, we place our values on others. And that comes down to projection. We take our personal history, our personal culture, our personal values, and we tend to project those onto others. We're upright and honest people. When we go and we have a transaction, we expect the people to have a commercial transaction to be honest with us because that's the way we are. But we know that's not always the case. But when we look at other people and other places and other times and other biblical stories, we often project our history, our values, our culture into a culture in a time that's vastly different from ours. And that's what we need to think about as we look at this study. So not only is there the problem of projection, it's a problem of perspective. So who's right? Is it six or is it nine? You know, they're both right. It's a matter of perspective. And it's what context that's in. So, the context that you look through affects how you view that and how you understand the word. So, we've got another test. So, this is a group effort. So, we're looking at 500 year blocks of time. So, it's 2022, but you know, essentially we're in around 2000. So what happened around year zero? What's going on then? Time of Christ. Okay, the New Testament era. How about 2000 BC? What's going on then? Think biblically. Abraham. This is the time of Abraham. So what's the threefold promise of Abraham in Genesis 12? Land, nation, sea, okay. So, 1500, what's going on in 1500? And about 2,000, less than 100 of Abraham's descendants go to Egypt. 15, around 1500, but actually 1466, 46, about a million will leave. So 1500 is about the Exodus. So from the time of that covenant until they leave, about 500 years. What happens at 1000 BC? King David, roughly. David takes the throne 1008, approximately. So that's about the time of our book. So it's been about 500 years since the Exodus. 500 BC, what's going on then? Okay, the post exile prophets. We've returned from exile. So, 1500 BC, we're leaving Exodus, we're leaving Egypt. We've, we've gone from less than 100 people to a million people. So, we have a nation, don't we? The time of David, 1000 BC. David was a man of war. He was a conqueror. He consolidated the nations. He expanded the borders. He enriched them through plunder and conquering the nations. He provided peace and prosperity for them to, to come. David is the pinnacle of Israel's history. That's the high point. So you've got a people, you've got a nation. Time of Christ, what do we have? Fulfillment of that third fold promise, right? We're on to a different realm. So, when we think back from our time, what happened 500 years ago? 1492, Columbus landed in Hispaniola, age of exploration. But more importantly, about 1446, Gutenberg, the press, knowledge. So, 
Things have drastically changed over the years. But when we look back, people haven't changed. Certainly innovations have happened. Now again, the world is a smaller place. That's global population numbers over the time. So what do you notice from about 2000 BC up to the time of Christ? 2000 year span, it doubled maybe. Because as lands were conquered, you would plunder that nation, you would take them captives, disease, things would happen. The world was a small place with a small amount of people. So as Israel grew to a million as they exit, left Egypt, grew more as in the time of David, what happened to the nations around them? After David, you don't hear about the Philistines anymore, do you? They vanished. So you always have this ebb and flow. Post-exile time, we're coming back from exile. You have a very small nation. So there's always this ebb and flow. So innovations happen, but people are always the same. And as we look at this book that was written 3,000 years ago, we're going to see very, very contemporary themes. The problem is we're so enamored with innovation that when we look back, we look back through the context of our personal history and our culture and our values that we become armchair quarterbacks of the Bible. So we need to take a look at this and make a connection. So how did the writings of 3,000 years ago apply to our lives? How is this all interconnected, especially in a unique book like this? How do those puzzle pieces fit together? And more importantly, is there a New Testament parallel or connection that we need to apply? All right, think back to the time of the patriarchs. How did people worship God? That's what they did, but why? Why did they worship? Were they instructed to worship? Abraham worshiped. He was chosen by God. How about Job? There's no indication that Job had a Jewish heritage. And he had a relationship with God. God used him as an example. Versus the devil. Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a prophet and priest and king. Jesus was the same thing along the order of Melchizedek. Obviously, he worshipped. Why did they worship? God spoke to the heads of the families, but why did people worship? God was worthy of worship. They worship from a sense of gratitude. Why do we worship? What do we have? We have a Savior who's conquered death, who's given us hope. We know that there's life beyond this life. Did the folks in the Old Testament, did they have that hope? What was their concept of life after death? <laughs> they didn't understand it. They knew there was something out there, and they referred to it as shield, sort of like God's waiting room. But they did not have this concept of I've gone to prepare a mansion for you in my, right? So we look forward to this reward. So, obedience. Obedience was a love language of worship. And we see that all through the Old Testament, from the time of the patriarchs to the time of Moses. But, Exodus 1, 17, but the midwives feared God and did not do the as the king of Egypt commanded them, and let the male children live. 
So these people didn't have the concept of heaven, the afterlife, of hope. What did they say to Pharaoh? A New Testament concept. We ought to obey God rather than men. Why? Because they had this relationship with God. They had this gratitude. And they worshiped through obedience. All right. 1 Corinthians 29, 15. Chronicles, sorry. Thank you. So, what is the, the concept of hope after death? There's no hope. The afterlife after death was very dim and very vague. So what about now? Do we have that situation? What's our situation? 2 Timothy 1.10. Okay, so their concept of the after, afterlife was there was no hope. And our concept is, through Christ, we have immortality and hope. Is that a different cultural change? So is that going to affect how we look at the message of Ecclesiastes? When we think about that. Now, another common thing we hear about throughout the Old Testament Drifting of the new is lex talionis. Anybody know what lex talionis is? It's a Latin legal term. An eye for an eye, the law of retaliation. Also, as you sow, you shall reap. So, we see that thread all throughout the Old Testament, don't we? What was Job's argument? I'm upright. Why am I being punished? What was, puni what was adversity viewed as? Punishment to God by God because you have sinned, wasn't it? Did Job sin? What did his companions view him at? Did they view him as a sinner? They're trying to get him to repent. Why? Adversity is struck. You have to be a sinner. You need to repent. What happened in the time of Israel? They're delivered from Egypt. They have peace and prosperity. They sin. They're oppressed. They repent. And they repeat the cycle again. How many times do we see this go on throughout the book of Judges? Throughout the entire Old Testament. Lex talionis. Anytime you see sow and reap. That is an overriding theme. But again, and these people lived in this time, in a bleak time, that's their mindset. We have the concept of hope. We don't have this mindset, do we? We know from, from Job that bad things happen to good people. The writer of Ecclesiastes is going to talk about that a lot. Bad things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. But still, there's this overriding view. In general, what you sow, you'll reap. The folks that sow good are going to have great rewards. But it may not be in this lifetime, and we understand that. There's always a concept of harvest. What is the fruit? So, at that time, the harvest, a bountiful harvest, was considered a measure of godliness. And suffering and adversity was viewed as a matter of sin. So, do things happen by chance? Is our life God's board game? Or is our life God's choice? Things happen to us by God's choice, don't they? So, 
bad things can happen to good people. When there are weather disturbances. When there are tragedies and adversities that happen in life. It may be part of God's plan. Look at what happened to Joseph. Joseph suffered some incredible adversity, didn't he? He was sold by his brothers into slavery. Was that a good thing? Did he sin? Did he do wrong? He went to Potiphar's household. He was very successful. He was elevated. And the next thing he knows, he winds up in prison. More adversity. And there's no light at the end of that tunnel. Did he do anything wrong? But the viewpoint was, he probably did. But what happened? Did he triumph? Because God had a plan. It's not a random choice. Oftentimes, suffering and adversity can happen to all of us. We're all confronted with different challenges, positive and negative challenges. And they're all part of God's plan. And sometimes it's a greater good that we may not see for many generations. And we see that all throughout the Bible. God's plan comes to fruition, often many years later. Under the sun, we're going to hear that a lot in Ecclesiastes. What's the concept of under the sun? It's our the life we're living. Life from a human point of view, without the, any divine intervention. So how do we live? We live under the sun too, don't we? We've got that different perspective. We've got hope of immortality, of life after death. So we have a vastly different perspective. Now, where does Ecclesiastes fit within the Bible? Old Testament, good one. <laughs> Poetry. Okay, so what sets the books of poetry apart? Okay, rhyme, cadence, wisdom, but they have a human voice. They have a human voice. Also, untruths may be included in there. The arguments that Job's companions make, they're not consistent with God's teaching in the Old or New Testament, are they? The writer's going to tell us some things in Ecclesiastes that are untruths, are era. And typically, in the wisdom literature, we also see that they connect it's connected thoughts. Now, when we look at Ecclesiastes, how does it fit in the Bible? Do we see Ecclesiastes in the New Testament? Any references? Ecclesiastes is one of ten books there's no New Testament references to. But certainly some truths are. How about Jesus? Where's Jesus in Ecclesiastes? Any Messianic references there? Any hints? What about God? Is God in there? Yes? Where was God in Solomon's life at this time? Most likely, file that away. We're going to talk about that length in later lessons. Okay, so when we look at wisdom literature and Hebrew poetry and poetry of this time and place, they typically fall into two categories. One is proverbial and the other is speculative. What's an example of proverbial literature? Proverbs, okay. Discourses on wisdom, lots of axioms, 
The other category would be speculative. What's an example of speculative literature, literature or speculative wisdom? Job, Ecclesiastes, we're probing the deeper things of life. What's the meaning of life? Do I have a purpose? Another thing that sets it apart is the point of view. Very few books are from a per first person point of view. When we look here, Ecclesiastes, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, and Zechariah are all from a human point of view. But all the others, other than Ecclesiastes, they're giving words guided by the Holy Spirit, aren't they? Ecclesiastes is a first person point of view as he's writing from his personal journal. And what we're going to see is he's providing a negative argument to demonstrate a profound truth. So remember that slide, where was Jesus? Jesus is on the other side of the coin. Jesus is the positive side of the coin. Ecclesiastes is the negative. Ecclesiastes is under the... S-U-N, with no God. And that's why there's despair and despondency. We live under the S-O-N. and We have a life that is positive, don't we? So when we look at this, there's minimal or no divine influence. It's a very personal narrative. It expressions a lot, expresses a lot of frustration and agony and inner turmoil. Those of you of a certain age remember a song that was on a TV show that goes, Doom, Despair, and Agony, Deep, Dark, Depression, Excessive Misery. But that sums up the mindset of the author. The author is not an upbeat person. And the question is, is this book a positive book or a negative book? So we'll talk about that later. He also asks many rhetorical questions. Again, he wants to be provocative to bring forth a point and make you think because he's probing the deeper aspects of life. Now, when we look at these things, there's a lot of connections to Job. The other Part of speculative literature because they're both asking the same question. God, life doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand what's happening. The difference is God answers Job, but it's not a one, it's not a two-sided conversation. He speaks to Job, but he doesn't give him an answer. Now, as we go through this book, chapter and verse. Visions are very helpful to identify things throughout the Bible. But we're going to see Ecclesiastes is a tangled pile of spaghetti. And there's a lot of divisions where, where they divide the chapters just don't make sense. So we've got to make connections. But I've looked at probably a dozen plus commentaries. And if you look at the outlines, every outline is different because this is a tangled pile of spaghetti. <laughs> But there's some consistent things we see in literature of this time. And it's a structure. There's what's known as the chiastic pattern. A, B, B, A. So we'll A, B, C, D, B, C, B, A. So we'll see these repeated themes. You're going to see parallels and couplets. And sometimes these parallels and couplets will be separated by multiple verse divisions. Paranormasia. I'm not an English uh, major, but it's a pun or a play on words. Now, because of translation, we can't appreciate that. An example, you know, this time of year, children need the presence of their parents more than presents, meaning gifts. That's an example of paranormasia. 
Now, if that was translated to another language, it wouldn't have the same meaning, would it? But many of these verses and sayings that we're going to see all throughout Ecclesiastes are plays on words. So it's very clever, elegant literature. There's always a lot of comparison and comparative things. Opposites are used. And when you see an opposite, it signifies inclusiveness. Jesus was the Alpha and the Omega. Was he just the A and the Z? He was everything in between. So anytime you see opposites, it's inclusive of everything in between. So always look for those connections. All right. Ecclesiastes is an acquaintance. We recognize Ecclesiastes when we see it, but it's not a friend. Acts is our friend. Chapter 1, there's a replacement for Judas. Chapter 2, day of Pentecost. Chapter 8, Stephen Stone. It's straightforward. We know what Acts is thinking. He's our friend. We recognize it immediately. Ecclesiastes is an acquaintance. We recognize when we see it, but we don't really know it. We don't know how it thinks. We don't really have that degree of understanding. It doesn't inspire any songs or hymns, does it? So where'd the title come from? Okay, okay. Does, does Ecclesiastes sound like any, the, any other New Testament term we're used to? What is the term for the early church? Ecclesia. When we talk about ecclesia, we'll refer to ecclesia as meaning. The church, the gathering, the called out. So if ecclesia is the group that is called out, Ecclesiastes is the one doing the calling. So, we refer to it as a preacher because the preacher is typically the one who stands up in front of an audience. But Ecclesiastes is a Greek term used in Septuagint for anybody who's speaking in front of an audience. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I'm not a Greek scholar. I barely have command of the English language. But... Because of the richness of the language, we need to look at some of this so we can understand, so we can place the history, culture, context, and the richness of the message and make application. Things are lost in translation. When things are translated from one language to another, we lose the richness of the language. We lose those subtle nuances. And we know that words matter. And we're going to see a lot of key words. Vanity, we've already seen it. 38 times. Under the sun, 29 times. The author is going to talk about I and me. I did this. Wisdom. And on the other hand, fool. And oftentimes when we see fool, it also implies sin. Labor, work, and toil. It's another theme. An underlying theme also is going to be death. There's a lot of dark sections in there. All right. Chapter 1, the words of the preacher. The son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. What does a man gain by all the toil which he toils under the sun? A generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Familiar, isn't it? So who's the preacher? Solomon, okay. So the preacher, the Hebrew would be Koheleth. I have occasion to talk to a number of rabbis in our community from time to time. They refer to the book as Koheleth. 
And it's the same concept. Someone who gets up in front of an audience and speaks. Now, he said he's the king, right? So we imply Solomon. What do we know about Solomon? Wisest man ever. Why is he the wisest man ever? Why did God give it to him? He asked for it. So, he asked for wisdom, and because he asked for wisdom, instead of other things, God said, because I gave you wisdom, I'm going to give you riches and wealth and honor. Now, what was the situation of David's dad? Or Solomon's dad, David. The nation was at war for the most part. He was a conqueror. He wanted to build a temple. Could he build a temple? Why not? We know a lot of bad things about David. David had a lot of failings, didn't he? But he's also described as a man after God's own heart, too. And now we have Solomon. So it's going to be a different story. So, Solomon's family tree, or David's family tree. It's hard to see, I know. David's right here in the center, and he came to power through his cousins. Joab was his cousin. Abinadab, they were conquerors. They were warriors. David had eight named wives, plus other wives, plus ten concubines. He ruled for 40 years. He brought the nation to pinnacle of prosperity. Caused affluence to come to them. He had 19 named sons and one daughter. What do you know about his children? Certainly Solomon is one of his children. Anybody remember the oldest child? No. Nope. Amnon. Amnon. What's Amnon's claim to fame? Lusted after his half-sister, raped her, and what was the outcome of that? Absalom, his half-brother, kills him. Absalom goes to the exile. He comes back. Eventually, he will create a civil war. And Joab will kill him against David's wishes. Later in David's life, Solomon's other brother, um, Adonijah, he's going to exalt himself and set himself up for king. Solomon is Bathsheba's second son. He's the one who selected to lead this household. How old was Solomon when he took the throne? He's the wisest man in the world, and he's 19 years old. He grew up in an affluent household, full of turmoil, with brothers who are against one another, brothers who are usurping the authority of their father, murders taking place in the household. Now, Israel has a king. Did God want his people to have a king when he made the threefold promise to Abraham? No. Who was supposed to be king? God. It was a theocracy. God's a sovereign ruler. But God knew what's in the hearts of men and says, there's going to come a time and you're going to say, set a king over me. And when you do it, don't amass money, or horses, or wives. So, that's not hard, is it? So, 1 Kings 10, what did Solomon do when he took over? Did he amass any money? Silver was so common, it was as common as stone. We talk about the streets of heaven being paved with gold. They're saying there's so much money there, the streets are paved with silver. Did they acquire horses? Absolutely. 
12,000 horsemen. That's a lot of horses. How about wives? Don't gather, don't gather many wives. How many wives does Solomon have? 700 plus 300 concubines. So I did the math. If he ruled 40 years, that meant there was a wedding about every other week. He's a busy guy. So what are the books that Solomon write? So at this time of prosperity and influence, he's reaping the benefits of his father. He's got this wealth. He's got a great nation. So did he write anything else? Song of Solomon. What else? Proverbs. Okay, a few Psalms. So these are the three books. So Solomon, Song of Solomon, you're looking at somebody talking about devoted love. Does that sound like somebody who's got 700 wives and 300 concubines? Probably a young man writing that. Young, idealistic man. Proverbs. Axioms of wisdom, what's that? Someone in middle age, they've got the nose to the grindstone, they're productive. We see from uh, Kings also that he wrote over 3,000 proverbs and over 1,000 songs. So Ecclesiastes, we're at the end of life. I'm at the end of my life, my life seems futile. So what would you tell your younger self to do? Would you tell them to make some changes that you did? That's our concept. Vanity. What is vanity? Nonsense. What's another concept? Emptiness. The Hebrew word is hevel. See if any other Bible characters resemble that name. The concept of vanity or hevel is something that is fleeting and temporary. Smoke, fog, vapor, you can't reach out and touch it. There's no substance to it. So our life is vanity. Soap bubbles, I think that's the best example of our lives. You've seen soap bubbles on a sunny day? These delicate spheres floating through the air, different sizes. Some of them pop immediately, some of them last a long time. Iridescent colors, things of beauty, they're gone and you forget about them. That's our life. We're this delicate, iridescent sphere, and it's gone, and it's not remembered. And that's what the author is thinking about. All right. We'll continue next week. Thank you.